What's going on guys? Welcome back to The Shelf. Today we are talking about Maxine, the third and possibly final installment of the X Trilogy. So as some of you may know, I'm a pretty big fan of the first two movies in this franchise. Um, I even did a review about them that you can find maybe right here. So check that out if you're interested. But anyway, I was really anticipating Maxine. It's high up on my list of movies that I was looking forward to for the year 2024. And since I didn't get to see it till a little bit after it came out, I started to hear some mixed reviews. That was cause for concern, but I said, you know what, let me just go check this thing out on my own. So we're going to get into it here uh, right now, and we're just going to talk about all the things that I um, appreciated about the movie and picked up on and thought were worth talking about. So one thing we were all able to gather from the trailer of this movie was that it was obviously set in the 80s. And with that comes almost this expectation of um, how we've come to s expect for movies to portray the 80s in movies and TV, which is this often sort of like glamorized and like overly polished and very superficial depiction of the 80s. It's this very like member berries sort of um, Amblin Spielberg-esque uh aura around it that we all look at it as through these like nostalgia goggles of how it was so great and amazing and Ty West's version of the 80s is a lot more realistic it is literally set in like the seedy underbelly of Hollywood and you know it deals with like sex workers and those who appreciate horror films and enjoy consuming um, less than desirable media you know, and along with that, Ty West is clearly very interested in sort of exploring the process of independent cinema and like making independent movies. And that's a through line that runs through all three of these movies, but it's especially um, present here, which I really appreciated. Ty West is kind of taking this approach of like, it's more methodical and it's looking at like how the sausage is made, you know, everything from the life cast of the mold of uh, Maxine's face to, um, you know, the way that they look at these movies, which we'll talk about a little bit later on, like just the people making them, how they view them in the context of uh, how they will be perceived and like what can be taken away from them ultimately. I can't remember the exact quote from the movie, but Elizabeth Debicki's character says that you, it's a B movie with an A message or something like that. If you remember the exact quote, please let me know in the comments because I can't recall it right now, but that's the, the core of it, right? And that's basically the same thing as saying that you can have a good, dirty movie, which is what they say in X. So, um, yeah, that's something that I noticed that was kind of running through each film and is basically like the mantra of this whole trilogy. And how oftentimes that good, dirty movie is usually a horror movie. And so they, they really are trying to uh, push the idea that um, since horror is more easily made, People are more willing to finance it because it's historically always made money and they're usually not terribly expensive. So auteurs like filmmakers have used the horror genre as a, um, a, a medium to get across a, a, an idea that's bigger than the movie itself. And that's something that Ty West is very interested in and has displayed himself in this trilogy as well as um, his other works as well. So something that I've been hearing a lot of people criticize about this movie is that the identity of the killer is very easily predicted. And even if you haven't seen the movie, you can maybe already guess who it is just by having seen X. So I'm not going to spoil the identity of the killer here, um, but if you've seen the movie, then you know what I'm talking about. But like so many of the other things about this movie, the identity of the killer being easy to guess, I am... I, I'm claiming this. Obviously, I can't know what Ty West intended unless he's gone on record and said this, but I think that the identity of the killer being easy to guess is intentional. And for him to be so thoughtful and meticulous about everything else in the rest of these movies, that for people to expect him to have just kind of accidentally put a really bad uh, twist at the end um, is a little silly to me. So I think it was definitely intentional. And it's supposed to be an homage to those early noir and giallo films where um, the killer is pretty easy to predict. But like those movies, that's what adds to the, the charm. Like it's, you, you watch those movies um, 
And the fact that the killer is so easy to predict is sort of a plus because it's charming and it's cheesy and um, it's just, yeah, it's just good. It's like you, you kind of associate the two. And in the context of those older movies, it doesn't really bother people because it's sort of like expected. A lot of movie going audiences would like to fancy themselves clever. And that's, there's nothing wrong with that. I, I would consider myself among those people. So when they are faced with something that um, is not particularly challenging for them to figure out as a moviegoer, as an audience member, then they almost kind of bristle at it and they look at it at face value and criticize the fact that it's easy to predict without maybe stopping to think that maybe it was intentional. And look, you cannot like the reveal and realize full well that it was perhaps intentional. That's not what I'm saying, but you have to at least give Ty West the credit and the, um, the, uh, the, you have to give him the benefit of the doubt to assume that he probably meant to do that at the very least, even if you don't like it. Another interesting aspect was the fact that the religious zealots um, being, being led by Maxine's father uh, are the actual villains and they are the ones committing the crimes that they're warning people about these satanic cults committing um, was kind of interesting. And so they're they're committing these crimes and then blaming it on the non-existent cult members to further their own agenda. So it's almost like this sort of uh, snake eating its tail situation. And so with the satanic panic, they're using that and then manufacturing it to kind of feed back into their own cause. And then things like the Night Stalker, which was a real thing, is a convenient scapegoat to be like, yeah, look, this is, uh, this is what you need to worry about, not, not us. And then, you know, it's implied that the ones helping Maxine's father at the end were parents of victims of either the Night Stalker or other si similar crimes. And so their, uh, I their idea is to join this cause of committing these crimes themselves to sort of uh, push their own narrative that Satanism is like everywhere and running amok and like poisoning the minds of children. And then they're able to use like the Night Stalker as the scapegoat. So it's totally like hypocritical and like doesn't make any sense at all. But like, that's how nonsensical the idea of, um, you know, blaming media for bad things in real life is. Obviously, there are people who will cite media as like being the influence for their um, their crimes. But uh, realistically, these people were already troubled to begin with. And then they latched onto something to use as like a symbol for their uh their agenda so that's why they brand the victims with the pentagram that they do um so that the police will think that it's these like non-existent cultists who are doing it so all that's just some, kind of like some thematic stuff that i picked up on in the movie that i like appreciated and i enjoyed that it was there and i definitely like picked up on it um and because the fact that i have done videos on x and pearl it made me in the process of researching that video um, which again, maybe was linked here somewhere. If I figured that out, how, how to do that yet, maybe it'll be there. But in the course of researching those videos or those movies, I should say, I learned a lot more about those movies because I'm watching them with that frame of mind. So going into Maxine, I feel like I was a little bit more prepared because I kind of knew what I was looking for having explored those two movies so much. So I was able to find things, I think relatively quickly that sort of feed into the already pre-established motifs that Ty West was doing with the first two movies. So another thing I really liked was the soundtrack. It was really good. Um, as you would expect for a movie set in the 80s, it kind of hits all the right notes. Uh, the St. Elmo's Fire song in particular was awesome when Maxine has the, uh, the keys. She really fucks Kevin Bacon up in that scene. It was pretty awesome. I really dug the inclusion of the two cop characters played by Bobby Cannavale and Michelle Monaghan. Um, that feels like, you know, there are so many 80s cop movies out there and then those two characters feel like ripped right out of one of those and put here. So I like, I appreciated their presence. And then Bobby Cannavale's character in particular was cool because, you know, he says in the movie that he wanted to be an actor, um, but he ultimately settles for the more realistic profession of police officer. And then that's sort of tangentially related to another line from Elizabeth Debicki's character earlier in the movie where... She reminds Maxine how lucky she is to even be there because ver so very few people ever find themselves in the belly of the beast. So, um, yeah, I definitely uh, appreciated that. So ultimately, though, I did feel like the movie was missing something 
to really kind of push it over the top because those themes can only kind of carry my enjoyment so far. Like I actually do need a little bit of a, a little, a little bit of that, like cinematic slop that to kind of be more entertained by, because this movie is kind of lacking in the entertainment department. The kills are pretty spaced out and yeah, it was ironically, it was just missing that X factor. A couple other little things that I caught that I wanted to include. Um, the end of the fake movie Puritan in the movie ends on like this freeze frame, which was cool because I was like, huh, that, that reminds me of some other Italian horror films. I'm thinking specifically of like Inferno or Suspiria that are like giallo adjacent. And they always just sort of like, they just kind of come to an end. It's sort of a running theme in like Italian horror movies and Italian movies in general. They like just kind of come to an abrupt pause. Um, so I, I thought that was kind of per perhaps um, intentional on Ty West part where you kind of just have this movie, this horror movie, just like close on like a freeze frame and then the credits just start rolling. On the technical side, this movie uses a lot of split screen, again, similar to X. Instead of just one usage of it in X, it's like used a lot here, which was even more thematically appropriate because that was a theme you saw a lot used in 80s movies. And then it also does, it plays with like the aspect ratio. I think it's like four by three aspect ratio. Um, so yeah. Similar to uh, Pearl and X, it uses of the time um, like transitions and stuff and like cinematic language techniques, which I appreciated. In the scene where um, the VHS guy gets killed, I don't know if this was intentional or not, but like some of the blood, it might have just been the lighting of the scene, but some of the blood was like that bright red blood that doesn't look real um, that you would find in horror movies, spe specifically of the 60s and 70s. like before they figured out like the, the correct blood uh, formula, like that makes it look real. So that might have been just the lighting of the scene. I'm not really sure. But um, again, that would be in line with like horror, giallo, that kind of thing. The scene where Maxine is getting the face mold um, made her sort of look elderly, um, almost made her look like Pearl. So like there was some intentional, I would say intentional uh, visual language going on there to kind of create that similarity in your mind. And it's something that Mia Goth probably actually had to do in real life when she was wearing that old lady pearl makeup. So I don't know, kind of very lots of layers going on, which, you know, I dig. Uh, it's, there's probably more things that I'll catch on repeat viewings of this. So I'm actually looking forward to getting this and definitely watching it a second or a third time to see what else. And I'll probably appreciate it a lot more, honestly. Quick note about the cast. Um, Kevin Bacon kind of steals the show. He's having so much fun with this role and you can kind of tell. Um, yeah, I really enjoyed his presence here as well as Giancarlo Esposito. He's like playing against type for once, which is really cool to see um, and definitely appreciated. He's not doing like a Gus Fring. Uh, knockoff, so that's good. The overall supporting cast is played by like really solid and memorable actors, and they all are able to do a lot with not a lot of screen time, and uh, mostly all of them leave an impression, so that's really good. So yeah, I think going into this, I was expecting one thing, and then I didn't get that thing that I was expecting, but I can't quite articulate what the thing I was expecting was, um, and I think this could be a case of the thing that I got is actually a lot more interesting than what I was expecting, even though I don't know what I was expecting. Just bear with me here. I think maybe some of you could relate and understand what I'm talking about. It's hard to articulate, but I think you get it. So I really do think I might need to watch this an another couple of times. And then I think I'll be able to appreciate it more and just kind of get used to the, the notion that maybe this is actually better than I think it is. If that makes sense. So ultimately, I really like how different all of these movies are while still all carrying the same mantra, which is just like essentially championing independent cinema and like the power of low budget movies, in particular, low budget horror movies and how they're able to be elevated by the people writing them, the people directing them and the people acting in them and how it can all kind of come together to be so much more than the sum of its parts. That definitely seems to be something that Ty West really likes, and it's something that I can appreciate, and I'm sure many other horror fans can appreciate. Um, so, yeah, with all three of these movies, I think, there's a lot more going on under the surface, and if you're willing to engage with them a little bit and really pick them apart and, um, 
and, and play along. It's a lot of fun, you know. These movies are very meta, all three of them, I think, because it's like they're aware of the sort of um, genre that they're paying homage to. And they really play with that and they have a lot of fun with it. And I think Ty West is a really clever filmmaker and I'm really excited to see whatever he does next. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a fan of his. If you haven't seen House of the Devil or The Innkeepers, I'll definitely suggest you go check those out. So if I was to rank these, I would definitely say X is number one. I really like X. And then Pearl and Maxine are kind of fighting it, fighting it out for the second spot. Um, I think I could see Maxine rising to second place on repeat viewings, but for now I'll go release order and say uh, X, Pearl, Maxine in that order. So yeah, that was my review of Maxine. Um, yes, overall, slightly disappointed, but um, I can see myself thinking about this movie for like weeks after the fact and uh, and kind of thinking about it more and more. And I think it could be one that marinates with me really well and uh, could potentially rise in my in my rankings of this year. Uh, as the weeks and months unfold. So if you haven't checked it out um, already, I would suggest checking out my video on X and Pearl, where I go more in depth and talk specifically about those two movies. All right, guys, so what did you think of Maxine? I'm really interested to hear, as always, what you guys think. If there's anything you picked up on that maybe I missed that you think I would find interesting, please let me know in the comments. Like this video, subscribe if you haven't already. And with that, remember to take care and watch more movies.